Again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels. And then verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. So the idea of bowels, since it's mentioned three times in one chapter, we need to look at that. I wrote on your outline that bowels represent the heart or the deep inward part. Uh, let's look over Jeremiah chapter 4. That's how we get this. We want the Bible to define itself, so then rather than looking up in a dictionary and finding out the bowels or the uh, intestines of a person, uh, we're just going to look and see what does it mean in, uh, in the context of Scripture. Obviously, it's not just referring to a good physical bowel movement, um, you know, because why would, that, why would what Philemon doing in Colossae have anything to do with that? It's a spiritual thing. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 19 Jeremiah says, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Because the context here is the captivity of Judah, uh, forthcoming here for, for them. Uh, but you notice from the verse we get a good definition of what bowels are in, in Scripture. Uh, he says, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh the noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O oh my soul. So I wrote on your outline that bowels represent the heart or the deep inward part, the deep part of the soul. And the reason it's used in the book of Philemon is because we're told that we are the church, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians, I'll just read that scripture for you. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. So they, all the believers as a whole are called by God the body of Christ, and then each individual one are members in particular. And it talks, and it goes in 1 Corinthians about how all that works, the hand and the arm and the foot and you know all the different body parts working together and how they have to all work together. Well, in the body illustration then, the thing that would represent what, you're, what you believe, you know, it's, is that bowels. The bowels then is the deep inward parts, the heart or the soul, uh, whatever term you want to use for it. You know, people will say, you know, I feel it way down deep in my soul. You know, I feel it in that deep part of me, in the deepest part of my being, I believe this is true. You'll hear terms like that. It's just a reference to, uh, spiritually speaking, how the inward part, the inward man, is where your doctrine or your belief should come from. And then it comes out from, and it, as a result, then you present your body as a living sacrifice, and then it's demonstrated through your flesh. So now that we're in Philemon, we've already got all the sound doctrine of Paul's epistles, Romans through Titus. Now Philemon is putting all that sound doctrine into action, and we're seeing examples of grace living, uh, we're looking at Philemon right now, his example. And so, that means that there should be some sound doctrine built up in your soul by the time you get to Philemon. And you've got the maturity there built up in the inward man. And we're going to see that a little later as well with Paul. So you've got that maturity built up in the inward man. And so then, the functioning of the body of Christ then comes out of the bowels, that deep inward part is what determines how it functions. It's the sound doctrine working through you. So he mentions in verse 7, the bowels of the saints. So that's that whole, in other words, the whole body of Christ is helped, spiritually speaking, in the deep inward part. They've got the sound doctrine as a result of thy love, the love of Christ being shed abroad, or the love of God being shed abroad in Philemon's heart to others, such that the saints see Doctrine matters, because I see it in Philemon. I see the sound doctrine working out. I see the love of Christ coming through Philemon that isn't in me because I don't have that sound doctrine, so I need to get the sound doctrine. So then the bowels of the saints or the bowels of the body of Christ is refreshed. Um, that's what, yeah, refreshed, um, you know, in inward part there. So it's not, there's no pain there. There's sound doctrine there. It's not a turmoil because... The sound doctrine is there of the body of Christ functioning properly as a result of the example here of Philemon. And then verse 12, Paul talks about his own bowels, and he says that again in verse 20, refresh my bowels. Uh, so it's put there for that deep inward part, and the reason we see it in Philemon, 
more than we do in other epistles is because that sound doctrine should be built up now. You should have all this fundamental sound doctrine of every epistle of Paul by the time you get to Philemon. So that now you've got, you're built up with strength in the inner man and you're making your decisions not based on the senses, not based on the flesh, but it's based on the sound doctrine that's in the inner man and that's working out through your flesh rather than vice versa. Uh, so that's why it's mentioned here and it's put there for that heart or deep inward part. So I wrote on your outline, therefore, by believing sound doctrine and walking in the spirit, Philemon is building up the entire body of Christ. Um, so because that's what he's doing, Paul then trusts Philemon to make a good decision based off of sound doctrine as to what to do with Onesimus. Uh, verse 8, he says, Wherefore, in other words, therefore, because of this, because I have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. So, uh, there's a lot here in these couple of verses. Uh, so he says there, he may be, verse 8 he says, Though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee. Uh, the word enjoin means, uh, in, like I uh, wrote on your outline, uh, instruct. Paul has the authority to instruct. Or, you know, uh, in other words, just like as, as someone who is over Philemon. Look over in Romans chapter 11, verse 13. The position of Paul in the body of Christ makes him such that he could instruct. In other words, you think of somebody like a, uh, the general, the president of the United States has the authority. He is over the entire United States military. He could declare war over a country just by himself because he is the commander, the uh, commander in chief. I got that on my shirt here, <laughs> commander in chief of the entire uh, U.S. military. Um, I'm, I'm not him. I just paid for this shirt. Don't, don't confuse me with the President of the United States just because I'm wearing this shirt. I know I look a lot like him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's not get into that. Romans 11.13, Paul says, Romans 11.13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul has an office as the apostle of the Gentiles. So he has the spiritual authority to make the command, just like the President of the United States could declare war or command anybody in the, in the military to do something, and they would have to obey. He could instruct them. They have to obey it, or else they're in, you know, they could be discharged, honor, dishonorable discharge or whatever they do. Similarly, Paul is like that in the spiritual army of the body of Christ. He is placed as the apostle of the Gentiles. He has this office that's above all other men at this case because of the dispensation of the gospel which is committed unto him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he is far above all principality and power and mind and dominion, according to Ephesians 1. So since he is above all that, Jesus Christ has the authority to appoint who he wants to be the apostle of the Gentiles. He appointed Paul. So Paul then is the, the apostle or the leader in charge um, of all men there uh, while he was alive there. And he could give an instruction or a commandment for Philemon to obey, and Philemon would have to obey it. So Paul says there in Philemon 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient. In other words, he has the authority as the apostle of the Gentiles. His office allows him to instruct or command Philemon, this is what you're going to do. You're going to let Onesimus stay with me. And Philemon would say, but he's my servant. Yes, physically speaking, yes, that's true. But spiritually speaking, I, Paul, am over you in the Lord spiritually, so I can command you to leave Onesimus here. And spiritually speaking, you'd have to obey. Uh, that's what he says, but he doesn't do that. Uh, he says there in verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. So instead of commanding him or enjoining him or instructing him, he beseeches him. 
uh, I wrote on your outline that a beseeching is basically a fervent asking, almost like a begging. Um, but what does somebody who beg, you know, you get that idea, if you beg, that's somebody who doesn't have authority. You know, in other words, if a child uh, is going to, wants to spend a night at his friend's house, let's say, the child can't instruct the parent and say, I command you to allow me to stay at so-and-so's house because the, the child is not in a position of authority. The best that the child can do is fervently ask or beg, will you please let me stay at, at Ronnie's house, you know, for tonight. Um, you know, please, please, you know, I'll do good, I'll do my homework, I'll do all this stuff. A fervent asking is the best that a child can do. But the parent, the parent can say, well, you can't stay at Ronnie's house. Well, why not? Because I told you so. Well, what's the reason? You have to give me a reason. No, I don't. I'm in authority. I'm over you. I don't have to give you a reason. And so Paul is in that authority, spiritually speaking, over Philemon. He could just command him. Onesimus is going to stay here. Philemon could say, well, I don't want him to stay here. I want him to be with me. Paul could say, tough, he's staying with me. Spiritually speaking, he had that authority. But yet, Paul takes a lesser role, is the point. In verse 9, he does it for love's sake. For love's sake, I rather beseech thee. So I'm going to ask you fervently. I'm going to take away the power that I have in the Lord. And I'm going to bring down to your level here. And I'm going to ask you. And so he asks him, it says, being such a one as Paul the aged. And a lot of people look at that and say, well, you know, Paul was older in life. Toward the end, this was written after Acts 28. He's in prison in Rome. Uh, so people say, well, he's just older. And that's the only place you'll ever see him call Paul the aged. Um, but what he's doing here, and, and that's true, he is physically older toward the end of his life. That's true. But he's not talking about physically speaking, I'm old. He's, this is a spiritual context because spiritually he has the authority to enjoin him or instruct him. But spiritually he's going to take away from that position and is going to fervently ask him or beseech him as Paul the aged. And that's a term referring to the spiritual condition of Paul in the sound doctrine. Look over in Titus chapter 2. Just a couple pages back. Titus chapter 2. Um, verse 1. Titus 2, 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. Now jump down to verse 6, Titus 2, 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So among the body of Christ, the rank and file of the army, if you want to call them that, the, the troops, um, with the men, they're divided into two categories. Young men are exhorted to be sober-minded. And once they have that doctrine built up in them and they're thinking their, their actions are based on that sober minded or the mind of Christ using that mind rather than the mind of the flesh or a corrupt mind or a defiled conscience. Instead of doing that, they think out the doctrine and they're sober minded. Then the result is, after years and years of that, Titus 2.2, 2, then the aged men, they're sober, just like the young men are supposed to be, but then they have these other characteristics. They're grave, they're temperate. They're sound in faith and charity and patience. So they've got the sound doctrine built up in them such that the love of Christ is shed abroad in their heart. love of God is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. They have faith in the doctrine and they have patience in God doing it instead of me trying to do it in the energies of my flesh. Uh, and so that's how Paul addresses Philemon. He says the aged men are like this, sound in faith and charity and patience. The young men are not. They're just supposed to be sober-minded and have that built up so that they eventually become sound in faith and charity and in patience. So in Philemon 1.9, when Paul says, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, what he's doing then, is he's taking a step back from being the apostle of the Gentiles. And he's not going to instruct him based on that. But he's taking and he's putting himself on Philemon's level. And he says, I'm just like you. Remember in verse 1, he says, Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. He calls him a fellow laborer there. Um, you know, verse 2, he calls Epiphany and Archippus our fellow soldier. Uh, down in verse 24, 
He says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, because of the sound doctrine that works in your hearts, even though Paul is in this position of authority as the apostle of the Gentiles, he takes a step back and he says, I'm on the same level as you. I'm a fellow laborer. I'm a fellow soldier, he says. And, and so when he beseeches Philemon, he doesn't command him as the apostle of the Gentiles. He takes a step back. And he says, I beseech you, we're on the same level. And he says, I am Paul the aged, meaning that I have allowed the doctrine, I've got the sound doctrine built up in me, and I've allowed it over the years to get me to a point where I'm sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. So, I am beseeching you as someone who has allowed the doctrine to build up in me, and the result is the love of God being shed abroad in my heart. This is something you can relate to, Philemon. Because, Philemon, you can't relate to what happened to me in Acts 9. You did not have the Lord speaking to you from heaven. You did not have that bright light shine upon you. You did not be caught up into the third heaven, as he talks about in 2 Corinthians 11, and uh, see things that, he could, that are not lawful for him to speak. Uh, Philemon did not have that experience because he is not the apostle of the Gentiles. Philemon's experience, though, is the same as Paul in that he's been given the doctrine. He's allowed it to work in the inner man, and the result then is built up. So then Paul beseeches him on that level. As your fellow laborer, as Paul the aged, someone who is sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience, I'm going to beseech you. In other words, I've gone down the same road as you have, Philemon. And I'm a little farther down that road than you are. And so I'm going to beseech you, recognizing that if I beseech you, then what that's going to happen is if you make the same decision, even though the decision is the same, even though you decide to, yes, I will allow Onesimus to stay with you, even if you make that decision, that decision is one that's based out of sound doctrine in your inner man rather than me instructing you, telling you this is what you're going to do. And if it's built up in the inner man, then what that's going to do then is going to advance Philemon into a greater acknowledging of the truth, a greater fruit of the Spirit being come out of him, rather than, well, I have to do it, so I'm doing it. And so that's why he says, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. I understand as Paul the aged and I'm a little farther down that road than you are, spiritually speaking, Philemon. So then I'm going to, for love's sake, beseech you rather than command you. Because then if you make the decision based out of sound doctrine rather than having to do it because you have to, then you'll get farther down the road too. And so then you'll grow. Your reward will be greater in heaven. And so for love's sake, I'm going to beseech you. Also notice from verse 8, he says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. What's convenient here is to forgive Onesimus. Onesimus has done some kind of crime such that he was worthy of federal prison, being sent to Rome. And now, because of you know he's what's taking place here, he's uh, going to re be released probably on good behavior or you know whatever it is, or if it's Philemon, who has uh, dropped charges, whatever it is, Onesimus is going to be released. And so now, Philemon could just go back and have Onesimus back as his physical servant and not change anything, or he could go forward from here. And the point is, then, what's Paul is given Philemon the opportunity to forgive Onesimus of whatever crime it was he committed against Philemon or whoever it was he committed this crime against. And Paul says this forgiveness is, is something that is convenient. Um, it's the convenient thing to do. And that's a principle that we can see in grace living for all of us. Is that if you don't forgive someone who has wronged you, um, what you end up doing, not only is that you don't have that relationship anymore with that person, that's severed, but and you make the other person feel bad, but you're hurting your own self too. How can the love of Christ be shed abroad through your heart when you have hatred towards somebody because you refuse to forgive them? 
And so what the convenient thing is spiritually speaking, although physically in the pride of your flesh, you say, I'm not forgiving that person. They wronged me. They're never, I'll never forgive them as long as I live. Spiritually speaking, the convenient thing to do is forgive people because then it allows the love of Christ, the love of God to be shed abroad in your hearts and goes toward others. It helps you spiritually. There's no hatred or remorse or anger toward this person because you've forgiven them. You've let that go. It helps you. Then it also builds that relationship back up with the person who wronged you, and there's that bond there. Uh, especially now that Onesimus is a fellow laborer uh, in the doctrine as well uh, for, for God. So, so, he's, so what's convenient there? is to forgive. For the flesh, it's not convenient because the flesh wants to lord it over people and have pride. But spiritually speaking, it's convenient to forgive. And you can see the difference between the law and grace in this category. We'll look over at Matthew 6 and Ephesians 4. Look at Matthew 6 and Ephesians 4. Under the law program for Israel, the previous dispensation, the one we're not in right now, uh, in this Lord's Prayer. He says in Matthew 6, 12, you are to pray to your Father in heaven, Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's a conditional forgiveness. Verse 14 expounds upon that, Matthew 6, 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So under the law, the law program for Israel, they do not have forgiveness of their sins. They do not have eternal life unless they are also willing to forgive others of the sins that have been committed against them. I mean, it clearly says, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, let's look at the rule in grace, the dispensation of grace, the mystery gospel in Ephesians 4 and verse 32. It's a different rule for us today. It's not what the Lord's Prayer says. That's not written to us today. What's written to us today regarding forgiveness, Ephesians 4 verse 32, the last verse in the chapter 4. Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tender heart and forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Today, we don't forgive others in order to receive forgiveness by God. Today, living under grace, for Christ's sake, because of what Christ has done, He has paid the price for us on the cross. God has already forgiven us because that's what Jesus Christ did. He forgave others on behalf of us. He said from the cross, uh, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, so he's already done that step for us. We are still to forgive others, forgiving one another, not in order to receive forgiveness from God, but in order to show the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That's why we forgive others. It's not a law motivation. It's a grace motivation. It's the opportunity that we have to share Christ's love with others so that they may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And so that's why it's called the convenient thing in Philemon's 1.8. The opportunity Philemon has not to lord it over Onesimus, and it's the same opportunity that Paul has not to command Philemon to forgive him, but to beseech him as Paul the aged, someone who is advanced in the doctrine, recognizing that spiritually speaking, the convenient thing to do is forgive Onesimus. Because then you do God's will. God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And if Onesimus committed a crime, let's say it is against Philemon, worthy of federal prison, you know, he did something pretty bad. It wasn't just, uh, we were watching Driving Miss Daisy last night. It wasn't just stealing a 33-cent can of salmon. You know, this was something major. It was, and we don't know what it was, but it was something worthy of going to federal prison over, going to Rome there. And if Philemon forgives him, that sends a great message to the people in the church there in Archippus' house that, wow, that shows what sound doctors, because the flesh says, I'll never forgive him for what he did against me. 
I'm going to hold that against him for the rest of his life. But when I, but Philemon, for love's sake, if he forgives him, then that sends a message to Apathia, Archippus, everybody in that house church, and says, the love of Christ is something special, because if it was me in the flesh, I'd never forgive that person. But Philemon has forgiven Onesimus. So, that tells me there's something to this. I need to find out from Philemon, you know, why is he doing this? Why are you forgiving him for doing that big crime against you? That gives Philemon the opportunity to share some sound doctrine with him. It says, God's already forgiven me of everything. So I'm going to be kind and tender-hearted. Well, he wasn't kind and tender-hearted to you. That doesn't matter. God has forgiven me. God has given me his love. And now I'm sharing that love with him. And that gives the people in the house church the opportunity to say, tell me about the love of Christ. How can I get to the bitter person, from the bitter person that I am to the person that you are, loving, uh, loving God and forgiving others? And then for the unsafe people who would probably know about what happened to Philemon because of Onesimus going to federal prison, gives him the opportunity to share the love of Christ so that they may be saved, so that they may believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sins. So you can see here that even though forgiveness is something that your flesh does not want to do, spiritually speaking, it is the convenient thing. So I wrote on your outline for verses 8 and 9, as the apostle of the Gentiles... Paul has the authority to instruct or enjoin Philemon in this case. However, because Philemon is walking in the Spirit, only a beseeching or fervent asking is necessary. Uh, this is grace motivation. And if you look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can see the next point, which is even God beseeches us to take our spiritual position. So not only does Paul beseech Philemon, uh, but today for all of us, God does not instruct us and say, as your God, as your creator, as someone who has forgiven you of your sins, I demand that you serve me. He doesn't say that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you see there it says, as though God did beseech you by us. And that's what God does. He doesn't force anybody to believe in his son as atonement for their sins. He doesn't force anybody to serve him. But he does fervently ask you through the Holy Spirit inside you, telling you, get in the word, believe the doctrine, allow it to transform you. And then, as a result, then, it will transform others. Uh, so that's the, the point there. And while you're there in 2 Corinthians, you can also look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and again see that grace motivation isn't uh, a forcing. It's the position is to be a helper of your joy. It's not to uh, command you and be under the law to do things. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 23 Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. So you're standing in the faith. You're allowing, uh, you know, as that position in grace, it's not, I'm commanding you to do this. All I am is a helper of your joy. You can believe what I say or not. Um, I'm not forcing you to do anything. But I recognize that if you do believe it, then that's going to help you spiritually. And the result then, it's going to help your joy. Rejoice evermore is the command in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. And if you forgive others and you allow the doctrine to work through you, then that helps you in doing that. It helps your joy. And so that's what Paul is doing. Um, and so verse 10, it says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So now we're getting into um, what the beseeching is about, what it's about. So uh, we'll stop for now, and then we'll come back after a break and conclude the book of Philemon, starting in verse 10. So let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for how you're dealing with us today in the dispensation of grace, um, how you are beseeching us to believe the doctrine. You've given us the Holy Spirit you're not forcing us as robots, but you're allowing us to use our free will 
uh, to bring us into the sound doctrine and to allow the love of Christ to reach others. And so help us to recognize that and live in this grace motivation to do your will. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. Next time we'll start in verse 10.